Okay, welcome everyone. This is the uh, November 1st, 2017 Ocean Policy Advisory Council meeting here um, at the Halloween um, Inn Express in Astoria. Um, so the first um, um, agenda item is member introductions. Uh, my name is David Allen. I'm the Coastal City elected official vice chair sitting in for our former chair, Scott McMullen. Um, and I will be running the meeting for just a short period of time until we elect new officers. So for the time being, let's just go around the table and start with you, Megan. Okay. Uh, who is Kisan? Uh, Jack, who is Good morning, everyone. It's really good to see you all. I'm Megan Clare. I work for the Confederate Tribes of Grand Ron, and I'm the Coastal Indian Tribes representative. I'm Laurel Hillman, sitting in for Director Van Lynn, <coughs> Parks and Recreation Department. Good morning. I'm Chris Castelli. I'm a policy analyst with the Department of State Lands. Good morning, Bob. My name is South Coast Representative Kenny Fisher, Houston. I'm Richard Heath from Brookings, and I represent the uh, South Coast Charter Sport and Recreational District. Lauren Goddard from Depot Bay, uh, OCZMA representative. Jennifer Purcell, a regional coordinator with the Department of Environmental Quality. Patty Snell, Coastal Program Manager with the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Uh, Charlie Plyvin, Coastal Non-Fishing Recreation. Uh, John Holloway, North Coast Charter Sport or Recreational Fisheries. Uh, Walter Chuck, Port of Newport Commissioner representing Ports Marine Transportation and Navigation. As I said earlier, David Allen, Coastal City elected official. I'm a city council member with the city of Newport. Jason Miner, Natural Resource Policy Manager for the Governor, Governor Kip Brown's office. Karen Brady, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And uh, Steve Shipsey from the Department of Justice, Council of the Council. Brent Holstaway, Baker, Newport, and I'm a statewide public representative. Jerry Thompson, Mickey County, and I'm the North Coast County representative. Kevin Dunn, I represent North Coast Commercial. Lindsay A, Oregon Department of Agriculture. John Allen, Oregon Department of Geology, sitting in for the Brave AD Director. Shelby Walker, Director of Oregon Sea Grant. Uh, Jimmy Faraday, Coos Bay, Public Gina Carter, the Nature Conservancy, and the State Legislative Conservation Center. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, and let's just go around the room um, and folks in the audience and starting with uh, you, Andy, you want to introduce yourself or we'll just start and go around the room? Yes, I'm Andy Lanier. I'm the Marine Affairs Coordinator and Primary Staff for you all as a council. I am Dan Carcillo, a Sea Grant Natural Resource Policy Fellow who is helping Andy <coughs> out today. And Lorinda DeHaan, Oregon Coastal Management Program. And in the audience, if you want to just say who you are and who you're affiliated with. I'm uh, Dave Fox with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Tom Libby, California Shellfish Company, representing Point Adams Pack Company in Warrington and Hallmark Fisheries in Charleston, Oregon. I'm Mike Herman, I'm the State Resilience Officer, Office of Government Kate Brown. I'm Chrissy Smith, and I, um, I'm with the Fresno Fresh Bay and the Fresno Beach River. I'm Melissa Kaiser, and I'm with the Stack Off Awareness Program and also Fresh Bay. And way in the back, here's someone I know. Hiding in the corner, Rob Lovett, Legal Counsel. Well, welcome everyone, and, and Kevin, welcome. You're our newest member from OPEC. Uh, just, uh, you're from Astoria, is that correct? I am from Astoria. Okay. Um, I fished for 30 couple of years and fished in Alaska for a while, and I've operated the Iron Lady the last 20 years out of Astoria. I sit on the Ground Fish Advisory Panel for PFMC and also on the Community Advisory Board doing a five-year review of the Catch Share Program. Well, welcome. We're glad you're able to serve in the North Coast Commercial Fisheries. Um, Brad Pencher uh, is the South Coast Commercial Fisheries and still is, uh, but uh, Brad, uh, I don't think will be here, but uh, Susan Chambers, who many of you know, will be uh, filling Brad's position, but there still is going to be a requirement of Senate confirmation, and I think that will happen probably in the short session. So you'll see Susan Chambers um, in Brad's position for the South, South Coast Commercial Fisheries at the first meeting in 2018. So with that said, uh, before we get into the uh, officer elections, uh, I asked uh, Jason on um, behalf of the governor's office if there's anything he just wanted to say. Um, if not, we can move on. But uh, Jason, you're welcome. And if anything you want to say to the office, Thanks, David. Um, 
A couple of updates from the governor's office. So well, first, uh, happy to have you have two policy advisors, the governor here today. Um, I think uh, in exchange for, I'm not sure that we were able, and either of us, I'm sure neither of us were able to attend the last meeting. Um, so we're doubling down on this meeting. Changes within the governor's office. Um, we hired a carbon policy advisor about three weeks ago. Uh, her name is Kristen Sheeran. That brings to a total of about five folks. Uh, the folks working within the Natural Resource Office for the governor, Ruchi Sadir on energy, Kristen Sheeran on carbon policy, myself, Oriana, who is also a generalist uh, handling a variety of agencies, um, and Jim McKenna, who works specifically on the Portland Harbor Superfund site. Uh, so we are a well-staffed office with administrative support as well. Um, Kristen is also, as you'll probably hear later in the update, uh, going to be the governor's staff on the Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia Coordinating Council. And by virtue of her taking on that role, in addition to a variety of other tasks she's taking on regarding um, climate and global changes and their impact on Oregon's natural resources, uh, that enables me to have a little bit more time to dedicate to things like the ocean policy uh, to OPAC. Uh, so I will be um, able to attend in person more of these meetings, which is great. Um, so that's a big change within the governor's office that uh, I wanted to update you on. Uh, second, uh, we are working on, and hopefully I'm not jumping the agenda, uh, we are working on appointments. Um, and I, I said that if we started talking about appointments, we might have to do this as a tag team update. Um, but I think we are more or less up to date. We did have, uh, we snafu'd a little bit on, um, uh, with, with our appointments office, but I think by the next meeting, uh, Susan Chambers will be, will have had a chance to go through Senate confirmation. Uh, we aren't gonna hit the November interim days, but we will hit the February short session. At that point, appointments are quiet for a little while. Yeah, and well, my appointment will be just the governor's appointment after the recommendation is made, and the chambers um, that will uh, require the governor appointment rather than having to go to the Senate. So that'll take more steps. Just make it a little easier. That's our so. Great. Well, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. So, and I'm also glad you're here, Steve. I know there was a little Thank you. question about that. So, um, and that gets us into the next agenda item which will be the officer elections, which means I'll be leaving this speech shortly. Um, and moving to wherever the next person sits here. Um, I did provide a memo, and I think everyone hopefully has had a chance to review it. Um, it was attached to the agenda, kind of going through the history of the officer elections, who served in what capacity over the years since OPAC first convened in 2005. Scott McMullen, who Hopefully we'll be calling in during the reception. We hope you'll, you'll actually be in, um, calling in through Skype or on the phone. Served as chair since 2005. Jim Good, who was a former statewide public at large member, served as vice chair until 2009. <coughs> I uh, have served as vice chair from 2009 until the present. And Gina Carter, in the back way at the end, has been our at-large member since 2015, prior to that it was Frank Warren, our, our former OPAC member. So we don't go through officers' elections very often as far as new people, usually it's re-elections, but this is a chance for new people to step into those positions. <clears throat> so with that said, uh, Steve is gonna weigh in on this, but right, uh, right now, now, the last, the last officer, officer elections. elections. Oh, you okay, Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the last officer elections were in December 2016. Under our procedures document, when we elect officers, it's for two calendar years. So at this point, all the officers, meaning Scott, who was the former chair, myself and Gina, have one year left in our position. And in speaking with Steve, the question was, if we elect new officers, will they just fill out one year and then we have to go through the election again? Or can we just basically adjust the rules and have the new officers serve for two calendar years starting <coughs> at today's election? And Steve, if you want to weigh in, I don't want to advise, yeah. and you can kind of just go through why we, what we can do at this point. Sure. Good thing you uh, vice chair Allen. Oh, just say David. <laughs> just, <laughs> I'm not formal. Just say David. No, uh, you know, we, we did discuss whether it should be uh, 
put on the board as fulfilling one more year of officer terms or two year and, and the, kind of the, the advice I gave was that the intent and the policy is to have some continuity and to not occupy our and no more or no no less than twice annual meetings with officer elections. So my recommendation to the council is that you select officers for the next two years. So with that said, is, is everyone in agreement that that's a good way to move forward? Yeah. I'll just get consensus on it. I don't see anyone saying that's not a good way. Well, if that's someone's outside. That's outside. We have no control over that. <laughs> well, we'll have to talk over the uh, yeah. Let me see if I can. Uh, anyway, so, um, so we'll move on <coughs> and we'll elect officers for two years, starting today. Even though it's for the calendar year, I'm more than happy to step down and have new officers take over today. So with that said, is everyone happy doing it officer uh, by officer rather than a slate? I think we've done slates, but um, is everyone comfortable just starting with the chair and then moving on to vice chair and at large? Okay, we'll do that. So what I'm going to do is just ask for nominations and just to be somewhat formal, ask for a second on the nominations and see how many folks are nominated for the position of chair of OPAC. So I'm opening it up to any nominations. Charlie? I'd like to nominate <clears throat> Gina Carter for chair. I have a nomination for Gina. Does anyone second that? Second. John seconded that. Any other nominations? I don't hear any other nominations, so I'm going to close the nominations. And Gina Carter is our only member being nominated, so I'm not going to even ask for a vote and just see is there consensus in having Gina as our new chair of OPAC starting in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I see a consensus, so Gina, in about five minutes, we'll be trading places. Okay. So now we have Gina as our new chair, and that will be for two years, Gina, so it'll be for 2018 and 2019 two-year period, which I think is a good way forward. So now, let's move into the vice chair, which I've been sitting in for the past eight years and more than happy to step down and have someone take over. So, any nominations for vice chair? Well, someone's going to have to nominate somebody. Um, John. Uh, I nominate Walter Chuck. Walter's been nominated by John. Terry's second at that. This could be easy. Any other nominations? Well, this can make things very easy. <laughs> so I'm closing the nominations. So we've got John always nominating Walter, Terry Thompson seconding. I see a consensus. Yes, I see a consensus. So Walter, welcome as our new vice chair of OPAC in about five minutes. And now moving on to the at-large position. And just, just to give you a, a sense of background of the at-large position, um, it's described in the procedures document, but typically the chair and vice chair and the at-large meet to uh, put together the agenda with Andy as staff and the governor's office and Shelby who is on the executive committee for CMAN. So really, the role of at-large as well as vice chair typically is just to, to put together the agenda. The chair has a little more responsibility and the vice chair sometimes helps the chair out with letters. So, if anyone wants to be at large, it's really about meeting prior to the OPAC meetings and helping put together the agenda. So, with that said, is anyone willing to be nominated or is anyone willing to nominate someone's name for that? Well, we're going to have to get someone to replace Gina because Gina's right now sitting there in that position and now she's been moving the chair. So we need someone to fill Gina's spot, but it will be for a two-year period. Uh, Terry? I'll, I'll nominate Charlie White. We got Charlie. Charlie, are you um, shaking your head yes or? Uh, yeah, I was not expecting that, but. Okay. So. I mean, you looked a little distraught there. <laughs> <laughs> it was did it, it didn't know if that was like <laughs> something you didn't want to hear. Okay. Charlie's happy with it, so we got. Uh, David. Yes. I don't know if I can nominate anyone. Well, no, but we'll get a second first. Okay. Anyone want to second Charlie's name? Bob. Okay, Bob. So we 
we've got Charlie, just a second, uh, Terry, and then Bob May. Bob May, that was. Any other nominations? Maybe I can have a question for Charlie. If he, if, uh, I certainly wouldn't want to um, undermine that nomination, but I, I'm looking at Richard Heath, and I'm wondering if he would also be uh, interested in that. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting consternation. Okay. And, and I think Charlie would be a fabulous at-large person, so would Richard, and I'm just offering. Well, you can offer the nomination if we have a second. We'll have a, a vote, which we've done in the past. There's nothing wrong with having a vote. But someone's going to have to second your nomination. Second that. Who's that? James. Okay, so we have Richard, and we have... Um, Karen with the nomination, and that was a James second. So, now that we have a contested spot, <laughs> let's give, um, what, I, what I propose we do is just give each nominee a chance to say a few words, and then we'll have an open discussion about the nominations, and then before we do that, um, we can vote one of two ways. And we've done it both ways in the past, depending on the nature of the decision. We can either, Go by hands and raise hands, or everyone can have a card, put their initials at the top, and put the name down of who they want. That way, people are maybe more comfortable in just putting a name down rather than raising their hands, and it makes it maybe a little cleaner. And then we'll tabulate it. It'll be an open vote because folks can see who voted for whom, but it will just be by paper, and then we can tabulate it that way. So, is there any preference, one way or another, for this um, uh, election? And Steve and I have talked about this, and either way works. Is there any preference, consensus, just to move one way or another with hands or by paper ballot? I'll give you my preference, but I'd like to hear from folks first. Okay. I find the hands. Is everyone fine with hands? Just the choice I'm giving folks, because Steve and I talked about this, and I wanted to give everyone an opportunity. So everyone seems to be fine with hands? Okay, I was fine either way, so whatever works for folks. So we'll just do a hand vote, and then we'll just make sure, Lorinda, where are you? I can. Or Andy, you can just count so we make sure we have, yeah. sometimes people put their hands up and down real quick, we don't know who works for them, so. So we'll do that, so. Oh, Shelby, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. David, just a uh, point of order. Yeah. In terms of people who can raise their hands, it is the voting members. Yes, I, I, yes, it's voting members only, since we're going to a vote, um, but, Anyone can weigh in on the discussion. It doesn't require just voting members to talk. It's just, yeah, to have to vote. And I was going to go into that. So um, after they spoke, I was going to open up the discussion to anybody, but the voting members are the only ones that can vote. So if you want to say something about it, Shelby, then you can vote. You can say something. So, Charlie, since you were nominated first, you want to say a few words? You don't have to. We'll just kind of move on to the vote, depending on what you want to do. It's up to you. I'm, I'm going to pass. Um, okay. <clears throat> I think folks know who I am and, 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 and what I represent and, okay. and my background. Okay. Folks have questions. Okay. Richard? Okay. 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 Uh, well, I don't have a lot to say. This is only my second meeting, so I'm not uh, really well versed here, but if selected, I'd be glad to be like that. Uh, as a large member and help with the agenda. Okay, so we can open up for just any comments from OPAC members before we take the vote. And this is open to anyone, whether you're a voting member or not. Well, I nominated you, even though if you've passed and who you represent, I want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> But the reason that I nominated you is I worked with you long enough and the people that I want elected, not that I don't know you, but I do know Charlie. And you have to balance environmental and industry issues and be willing to work for common goals that are good for all of us. And that's why I voted for you, or nominated you. So I'm giving your speech for you. <laughs> Any, anyone else? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Terry. Uh, I, I was going to say a few words, but I was going to let, wait until the very end. Okay. Well, I've had a chance to work with the at-large positions over the past seven or eight years since it's been put in place. So really, it's all about 
working with the chair and vice chair and the staff and helping put the agenda together. But, you know, we, we created uh, through the OPAC procedures document uh, three positions through these types of selections in addition to the executive committee, including the governor's office representative and the CGRAP representative, and they're always there as part of the executive committee. Um, I think either, I mean, you know, I don't know Richard as well as Charlie, but um, as Terry said, you know, there's both very solid and um, I'm sure either would do a, a fine job. But I'm kind of looking at it more from just balance and perspective, not the necessary the person who's in the spot, but just the geography and everything else. And the way I look at it is we've always tried to create some balance on OPAC throughout the entire coast, north, central, and south coast. And right now with Gina being from Portland, but kind of central, and and, um, and then we have um, Walter being in Newport. I really think it's nice to have some other region of the coast represented on the executive committee in the voting membership role. And then Richard, you're from South Coast, and I think that's important to have South Coast represented. And more importantly, since Gina represents a conservation interest, and uh, Walter represents, I would say, <coughs> probably a, a uh, government interest, so to speak, because you are an elected official. I think we should have on the executive committee someone representing fisheries interests. And if we have Charlie on there, even though he's in the non-fishing recreation, he, you know, we consider that to be somewhat of a conservation interest. And I'm not saying that Charlie wouldn't do a fine job in the role, but I think from a perception standpoint, it's nice to have that balance. So you're from the South Coast, you represent a fisheries interest, and I think that balances out the executive committee. So even though Charlie would be a fine candidate, I think I would probably like to see that balance with your uh, a nomination uh, on executive committee. And that's all I have to say on that point. John? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> well, I would like to speak for, uh, well, on behalf of Richard. I've known Richard for many years. And uh, he's the vice chair of Salmon Advisor Panel in the PFMC. And Richard always gets the job done. And he's very level-headed. And he's collaborative. And he's really been a done a stellar performance in collaboration between the commercial trawl sector and the salmon fishermen, both commercial and recreational. And it's put together some really important compromises never seen before at the PFMC. Thank you, John. Um, anyone else is carved up? Um, I don't see that. So we'll start with the voting by hand, and we'll start with the first nomination, which was Charlie, and then we'll go to uh, Richard afterwards. And please, folks, when you raise your hands, keep them high and keep them up until Andy's been able to make the count. So those in support of Charlie Flybon's nomination, please raise your hand. I should vote for myself. <laughs> no, I, I, that's all. That's very reasonable. So we have. Keep, so it's Terry and Charlie. I think that's all I saw. I count Those two. in favor of Rich, two. Those in favor of Richard. Richard. Richard, welcome as the at-large member, and Charlie, um... Horribly distraught. Horribly distraught. <laughs> Horribly distraught. I'm going to tissue. Yeah. I don't know if you're a Dodgers or an Astros fan, but whatever team you're rooting for tonight, I hope that team wins now. So. Okay, so with that said, let's just take a short kind of <coughs> two-minute break so we can start rearranging chairs. I'm going to go into Gina's spot since she's at the very end, and I can kind of make it quick. <laughs> Walter's already in place. You know, he was. Were you predicting something, Walter? No. Okay, I think Walter had. Walter was, And then, uh, uh, Richard, we. Yeah, I'm just going to trade with. Uh, it's just going to be Gina. Yeah, just. Gina. Yeah, no, I'm
While I'm doing this, I should take the opportunity to point out that we are, as an agency, changing the location where the official OPAC repository is going to be held. And that's all going to be now on the OregonOcean.info website. Um, so you can um, see some glorious photos of OPAC's illustrious history. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, me sleep, that's me sleeping over yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> I see you writing there, David. Um, there are, is a document repository on the right uh, with a meeting date associated with it. <clears throat> I'm hoping I put the agenda into this folder. If not, I have it on my machine. sent out months in advance of the meeting, so there's, there can be a break between when I send it out and the next meeting. Um, it, and this is a good introduction or orientation for new members of the council. We don't do minutes per se, as in everybody's uh, words have been written down verbatim. We do a high level summary of um, the issues decided and or positions taken. Usually that's when the council has had a vote and uh, or a consensus agreement. Those are recorded right up at the top of the meeting, uh, followed by uh, presentations. Um, in this instance, there was a note that there was a, a letter to the governor that was agreed upon and then sent after the meeting, and that was added as an addendum uh, to the agenda. Um, there's a list of the presentations that occurred during the meeting, and then there's a uh, listing of the attendees, both members, uh, present and absent, of voting and non-voting, uh, staff, there's public comment uh, from those who attended and provided official public comment to the council. Then there's a list of the distributed materials, uh, any additional resources that are appropriate for the council to receive at that time. And uh, there's a video index now this video index is, is going out of style now uh, because we are actually posting the meeting videos online on the Oregon Ocean Info site by their agenda item so that you can go to any particular one of these and not have to request a disc from uh, the agency. So this is a, a very high level summary of what was there. Gina, I'm sorry for your first agenda item having not sent it out ahead of time. That's, uh, that's my responsibility and I should have uh, made sure that everybody had a recent copy of this. Um, do you want to give maybe people a little bit of time?
today to have looked over and improve it, or do you want to approve this now? Um, since I don't think people have had a time to review it. Yeah. Do you want to leave it on the screen for? I can do that. Do we have a presentation that's on the screen next? Uh, yes, we okay. do. Maybe we can make copies here at the hotel and distribute yeah, them and revisit that. this after lunch. Maybe Lorenzo. It seems like a uh, quick read, frankly. Yeah, it's a three pager at most. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Okay. So we'll table this for now. Gina, can I just say one thing? Of course. What, Andy, I think what happened, I'm not, I mean, it's nice that you're taking responsibility, but you, uh, what you did, there, you did, what we've done in the past is you usually send a link to the OPAC website where when you link to it, you see the draft meeting summary right there. So yeah. I think we usually uh, allow OPAC members to link in and look at the draft summary rather than having to send it out as a specific attachment. So you've done that in the past. So I think maybe just with new members, we can either agree that everyone just goes to the link and opens it up themselves, or you can send it out by attachment. I think either way it works depending on what people feel is more appropriate. And there's usually one more step, and that's to send the, the draft, the draft summary to the executive committee, and they right. do it once over before it goes online. Okay, so with that, we will um, table this until after lunch and revisit it and um, move on to our next agenda item unless anyone has anything else they'd like to say. Charlie. I just have a kind of point of order question. I don't believe I've <clears throat> ever received an email or a call for agenda items for OPAC. Maybe I'm wrong. And I don't know if that's a uh, practice of the past executive committee. Um, I don't believe that there's anything that, that says you can or you can't. Um, and so I'm curious if does this executive committee uh, potentially have the intentions of reaching out to the rest of OPAC prior to setting the agenda? I usually do have at least one email that's sent out to the members ahead of time for agenda items, and then during the course of the year, when OPAC members send me things, I will I will create a list of the <coughs> items that have been requested, which are then fed to the executive committee, and then they will schedule the agenda, trying to fit in as many of those topics as possible. Uh, so then that would but come from you? It, yeah, it would usually come from me as a staff for the council, and I, I collect those and then allow the executive committee to review and decide what they would like to do with it. Okay. So Maybe I missed that for, for this particular meeting, um, which is quite possible. Uh, I, I would appreciate maybe a, a bit of lead time, given I know it takes a little time to put the agenda together, and I, I understand too, if not everything makes the agenda. In the first five minutes of our uh, new executive team, we'll put that on the to-do list to talk about. <laughs> Thanks. And our next first meeting. That's a good request, though. And uh, Andy does do it, but maybe we can um, highlight it better or make it more formal somehow. Or increase the frequency of that request. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Did I say what? It is laid out in your, in your policy document how the agenda development goes, and it does include uh, the opportunity for additional items. Yeah. So Charlie, uh, you make a good point. Uh, because Scott stepped down as out, stepped down as chair in April, it, it, we didn't really get to the uh, agenda until kind of late in the process because of just that issue and a few other things. So um, we didn't send it out directly to members, but I do know in the past, at the end of each OPAC meeting, um, either we say it or if discussed, people know that they can provide us with agenda items, but I think the, the focus of this agenda was, since we have so many working groups, we wanted to give them the updates, uh, but you make a good point, and I think we'll probably do that moving forward since we have a new chair and vice chair in place for the next few years, but the, the logistics with Scott stepping down and trying to step in and get that all sorted out, things fell through the cracks. And, and ironically, David, I, I bring that up because I chair the Marine Free Working Group and uh, did not have uh, the opportunity to give an update on that here today. So. Well, I, I'm surprised about that. I thought that would have been... Anyways, so I think Andy's noted what you just said. So. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other comments in the section of the agenda? All right. 
Moving on, we're going to, uh, Robin Hartman is the chair of the Territorial Sea Plan uh, Rocky Shores Working Group. She's not with us today. She had hoped to be here. I talked to her last week, but she's not here. So Andy is uh, staff to that working group is going to give an update to us. And um, we have about 60 minutes. Again. Great. So thank you, Chair Carter and Chuck, and Vice Chair Chuck. I'm going to have to, it'll take me a while to get used to that. Um, <laughs> it's, it's been a while since we've had uh, a leadership change on the council. Um, and I, actually that is uh, one of the first agenda items that I'd like you to think about while I'm giving my presentation is to uh, potentially provide a new chair for the Territorial Sea Plan Working Group on Rocky Shores. Um, I've had a hard time getting Robin's time and attention as needed for uh, this process. And in her defense, it, it hasn't really kicked up until the last several months where we've been doing work. Um, but I need somebody who can be engaged and to help steer this ship from the council. As a staff person, it's, I'm supposed to be assisting you, not the other way around. Um, so if that's something that this group can think about, uh, having uh, appointing a new chair for that working group, um, that's something that I would like to have happen at this meeting. Um, so why don't we set that aside, I'll give a, a presentation on where we are and where we think we're going, um, and then we can bring that up in the discussion portion of the agenda, does that sound okay? I'd like to do a very quick sound check, so those, uh, we do have a few people online who are watching this, if, if you could send a chat uh, on the, the Zoom system, we have somebody moderating that, so I'd like to just make sure that um, I can be heard while I'm presenting online. Um, I'll go ahead and move forward and hopefully Deanna will give me a thumbs up here in the, in the near future. Um, so the part three of the Oregon Territorial Sea Plan is focused on rocky shores. It provides a broad overreaching management strategy for how the state of Oregon uh, thinks about and uh, provides recommendations for the future management of these important areas. Um, OPAC is the steward of the Territorial Sea Plan, and in that role, uh, you have the responsibility to look at these chapters of the Territorial Sea Plan over time to make sure that they are kept up to date, that they are relevant, and that they um, are in a good state moving forward as, as we realize if new management issues or um, and so that that is one of uh, your jobs as a council and in your December 2015 meeting uh, the council agreed to take on this issue as one of its priorities and start an amendment process um, the strategy itself includes policies objectives uh, scientific data on the resource resources that are present and the uses that are present in, in those systems. And it provides specific <coughs> management recommendations uh, to specific sites and situations on the coast as a broad overview. Uh, in and of itself, the Territorial Sea Plan does not uh, constitute uh, regulations, and there is no enforcement of that. So it, the Territorial Sea Plan and the Rock Resource Management Framework itself relies on the other state agency authorities and federal authorities and programs that exist in those areas. So think of it as an <coughs> overarching umbrella for the coordination and management strategies of these areas. There's a lot in part three. It's one of the longest sections of the territorial sea plan, or it was the longest before the part five was officially adopted. Um, it provides your uh, policy framework, an introduction to how the strategy would be carried out. It provides a summary of the existing management at the time when the plan was approved, um, including providing the context for those management recommendations that are present in the plan and accompanied by a site analysis <coughs> and a categorization of the different uses and resources that are there. Um, this section of the Territorial Sea Plan was amended in 2001, but only for a very small portion of the coast at Cape Arago. Um, 
and in that process, they they recommended a way forward for us to consider as a council. And uh, when when we moved forward, uh, there was some reorganization of the content and of the management recommendations at that location that occurred. So it did give us uh, suggestions on how we should be moving forward with this broad strategy approach. But first and foremost, it's important to recognize how significant of a resources uh, these are on our coast. Almost 41% of our shoreline has uh, rocky substrate associated with it. And these are often very uh, ecologically rich uh, systems that uh, draw the attention of numerous uh, users. It, and when you think about it, this is really the place where most of Oregon's public interacts with its marine environment, right at this very edge. Um, you know, over 10 million visits to the, the shore and rocky shorelines have been recorded through um, state parks, visitor counting, parking lot counts over time. So this is an area that attracts a lot of attention and has a lot of significant resources. So you can see why the council, when they originally adopted the plan in 1994, would have an overarching framework for management. One of the uh, pieces of the Territorial Sea Plan also guides when a portion of it should be reviewed or amended over time. And there are criteria that were put down in the plan um, to say if one or more of these are meted, that you then have a duty to go back and look at and update that portion of the plan. So in response to more detailed study and analysis, so basically when our knowledge of information about the resources or uh, the uses in a place changes, um, circumstances affecting management may be a land ownership change along the coast, for example. Um, other site designations in a nearby area or related to a rocky shore, uh, when those come into being, they have not necessarily been adopted into our, our management framework and thinking when uh, we look at these sites. And great examples of these are sites that exist on the landward side of our recently established marine protected <coughs> areas and marine reserves. Um, and then the last criteria is upon the written request of a stakeholder body uh, that's uh, provided to you as a council. And that did happen at the, two, at the December 2015 meeting there was a letter submitted to you by the Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition that asked you to take a look at this portion of the plan again. So over time, um, over the many years that have passed since the original adoption of, of this portion of the Territorial Sea Plan, uh, there have been many circumstances that have changed and uh, we have a broad recognition and the council uh, recognized that at its meeting that this is a Again, your responsibility to move forward. We have met these criteria, uh, justifying the time and effort to spend on this <coughs> amendment. Um, one of the interesting things, and I, you guys have, might have already seen this, is this uh, change in our understanding of ecosystems. <coughs> this, if you uh, aren't sure of the, the context, uh, you might not know that that's a map. Um, it kind of looks like something you would see in a petri dish underneath a microscope. Um, and, and in our environment, our information technology has changed significantly to today. So that's the same location, uh, basically relatively speaking. Um, and with <coughs> one example of a data set and an information resource that we've collected to help understand this environment. So, so that's an aerial photo with um, the results of a survey that was done on the Oregon coast that took uh, photography of the shoreline and, and presents that information back. This flight was specifically flown at a, a minus tide time period so that you can see the subtitle features. And it, it's focused on um, capturing the characterization of the environment. There are also map resources that go along with this. Um, and these photographs and the maps and the images are all presented to the public through 